Hello, everyone. Welcome to Gift of Health Weekly Wellness Chat. We are here again Tuesday evening to be with you to take uh, some live uh, questions. Any questions you may have about uh, food and health. For those of you joining us for the first time, I am Dr. Arjun Raipudi. This is my lovely wife, Dr. Shobha Raipudi. We are both uh, co-founders of Gift of Health and the board certified lifestyle medicine doctors. We are focusing on preventing and reversing disease, helping you lose weight and keep it off, have more energy and fun in life through better diet and, uh, and lifestyle. So let us know where you are joining us from. Uh, I see how, how the audio and video is. Oh, hi, Hope. Hello, Maureen. How are you? How is the audio video good? Sound is good. Hi, Mike. Glad to see you joining again. Excellent. Yeah. Give a like, thumbs up, <laughs> our heart, share it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's how that's how Facebook knows it. <laughs> like um, if you want to, perfect, excellent, good, good. Yeah. So if you uh, how was uh, how was the last week for you guys? Any challenges you guys you're having in terms of uh, eating well? moving more, stressing less, type it here, share it away, and uh, we'll do our best to answer uh, any questions you may have. Excellent. Good, good. Oh, Geraldine, good to see you back here. We missed you too. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Good, good. So keep the questions coming. We do have a question that uh, came today on the Jerry Walsh. He posted on the Gift of Health uh, uh, page. His question was about uh, gastritis. Uh, are there uh, foods you should avoid if you have gastritis? Is gastritis curable? <laughs> Hopefully two questions on the same topic allowed. <laughs> yes, Jerry, two questions are allowed. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> okay, so are there foods you should avoid if you have gastritis? So first of all, gastritis is a condition where you have inflammation of the stomach wall. So our stomach has um, like uh, four layers. The innermost uh, layer is called the mucosa. Then you have the, the deeper layer with a submucosa, and then there is a muscle layer, and then the outer coating, it's called the serosa. So if the inner lining of the stomach gets damaged or inflamed, it's called uh, inflammation. Like if it is just a, um, irritation and inflammation of the inner lining, it's called gastritis. But if the inner lining is like damaged to, the, to an extent that there is a crater or a dent, we call it as stomach ulcer. So that's the difference between inflammation and ulcer. Inflammation uh, or gastritis is just irritation of the wall, whereas uh, ulcer is like that wall is irritated and a part of it is like damaged and destroyed so that there is a dent. So that's that's actually uh, a very good uh, demarcation because mm -hmm. yeah, a lot, a lot of people might be wondering what's the difference between gastritis and ulcer? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so remember ulcer, a gastritis is inflammation or irritation of the mucosa inner lining, whereas ulcer is that the mucosa is, is damaged and the underlying submucosa and the muscle layers are being exposed. So uh, this, uh, in the, when, it, when it starts out uh, inflammation, it starts out as inflammation and if the gastritis is not looked after, it is not treated well, you're not getting to the cause of it, then the gastritis can progress into developing gastric ulcers, like the stomach ulcers. And if the stomach ulcers have, they stay for a long time, if they're not addressed, then having the stomach ulcers for a long time itself can increase, put you at a higher risk of getting stomach cancer. So what causes inflammation are the gastritis of the stomach wall? It's pretty much anything that increases uh, um, acid production. So our stomachs, like your stomach, my stomach, all of our stomach, stomach makes acid. It is normal for our stomach to make acid. It's called hydrochloric acid. And the acid helps in the digestion of the food. The stomach acid that is normally produced has a lot of function. It helps in the digestion of the food. It helps in the absorption of the minerals. And it also protects us from the bacteria that are coming from outside. So many functions. 
Now, the problem is, the, the problem happens if there is excess acid. See, we have mechanisms in our stomach like to keep the acid uh, under check. Like let's say if you're having excess acid, uh, we have a mechanisms to increase more mucus in, in the stomach so that like that mucus forms a, a nice barrier. barrier to protect the stomach mucosa. But if the mucus production is being damaged or if the acid production is way too much, then you get this uh, gastritis and progressing into ulcers. So what, would, what do you think would uh, like increase the production of acid? Any guesses? What foods or what lifestyle habits you think would uh, increase the acid production in the stomach? If you guessed smoking, you're right. Like people who smoke, they have more acid production. Like every time you smoke, you have more acid. And if you're drinking coffee, then there is more acid production. Um, if you're drinking alcohol, that increases acid production. When it comes to food, <laughs> are you ready? You'd be so surprised. It's uh, any guesses which foods cause the most acid in the stomach? It's the chicken, turkey, beef, pork, fish, ham, moose, any uh, eggs, any animal protein the increases acid production. The more protein you take, the more animal acid, the animal more, the more protein you eat, the more animal protein you eat, the more acid stomach has to make. Because see, the thing is that when you take the animal protein, the, the protein has to be broke, has to be broken down into small peptides and then into amino acids. So for this uh, protein to be broken down, you need an enzyme called pepsin. And this pepsin enzyme can only be active when you have enough acid in the stomach. What that means is that the more protein you take, the more pepsin that the stomach has to make. And to keep the, to make the stomach, uh, to make the pepsin, the stomach makes a lot of uh, acid. Makes sense? So it's, Maureen say, is saying sugar increases acid production. Maureen, it's not the sugar that increases the acid production. Yes, processed foods, like if, you're, if, they're, if they're fried and if you're using a lot of processed ingredients, yes, they can increase the acid production. But the more than anything, the foods that most people don't realize that increase acid production are the chicken, turkey, beef, pork, moose, meats, animal meats, animal flesh increases acid production. Uh, eggs, cheese increase acid production. The other thing is, let's say if you're eating a lot of cheese and butter and oils, the more fats you eat, then the acid doesn't clear up from the, uh, from the stomach. See, the, the, the job of the stomach is to break the food, break the food and also like churn it, like grind it, churn it and make it into a ball and release that into the small ball, which is the duodenum next to the stomach. So if the stomach, if the food and the acid, stomach acid sits in the stomach for a too long, then it can damage the lining of the stomach. So you don't want the food to be sitting in the stomach for too long. You just want it to be, uh, you just want the food to stay in the stomach just enough so that it gets broken down and goes into the uh, small bowel. But uh, if you, um, if you're eating too much cheese and uh, oils and butter and fats, then the stomach doesn't empty that well because it, it, when you eat these uh, excess fatty foods, it releases a hormone called cholecystokinin, which slows down the emptying of the stomach. And it, it also opens up, like when you eat the processed foods and the, and the fats, it opens up the, the sphincter between the food pipe and the stomach, which makes it easy for the acid to come up. So cheese, butter, eggs, meats, oils, processed foods you wanna avoid. So Maureen is saying uh, sugar or sweets give me heartburn so bad. Well, Maureen, like uh, the, the thing is most of the sweets that, that are store-bought, like you take cookies or, or, uh, or uh, muffins or um, cakes, uh, any sweets that, that you buy in the store have a lot of oil, lot of fat. fat and processed ingredients in it. 
So it's not it's not the sugar just alone. yeah it's alone that is causing it. It's the whole package that's causing the problem. But if you were to eat like a, a fruit, like a fruit has sugar in it, right? Would you uh, like you know if you eat apples or berries or bananas or like so you may do fine. But some people may have acid reflux to certain foods, but most the majority of the foods that cause acid reflux are actually the, the animal protein, the, the fats, the processed foods, the coffee, and uh, processed plant foods as well. What about chocolate? Yeah, chocolate, <laughs> yes. Like chocolate, like, you know, chocolate is sweet. Um, <laughs> and and uh, also has a lot of fat. <laughs> yes, a lot of, it has a lot of sugar in it, a lot of fat, like, the, you know, cocoa powder. Has anyone tasted cocoa powder? out of the box or the bottle? How bitter is it, cocoa powder? It's so bitter, right? You take a spoon of it and you throw it out. But to make the cocoa powder into nice sweet chocolate, can you imagine how much sugar you have to add to make it sweet? And also to make it creamy, how much fat you add? So chocolate is a concoction of sugar and fat. Yeah, very bitter, right? Like, so it's to make that very bitter thing to, to be palatable, you have to add a lot of fat and, and sugar. And most of the fat that is added to the chocolate in store-bought one is actually the, the milk, uh, milk fat, the dairy fat. And the, like the, as we just talked about, the more fats you eat, the, uh, the more acid reflux you're gonna have because the fatty foods they uh, open up the esophageal sphincter, makes it easy for the acid to come up. So Mike is saying... So Mike is asking, um, I'm drinking more water with lemon juice, as you described to me, but I still hate water alone. I was wondering if Atlantic Ocean mussels <laughs> are good for you. Well, um, Mike, uh, there are two problems with mussels. One is uh, those uh, mussels have a lot of uh, protein in them. Again, as we said, the more animal protein you eat, the research shows that there is more acid production. Um, the other thing is like, uh, you also wanna look at this, uh, this farming of this, these mussels. Like, you know, when you're farming these, these uh, from the sea, if for every pound of mussels you, you catch, you, ca you, you have at least, 10 to 15 pounds of bycatch, right? Like, so, so many other things that are caught to just to harvest these mussels. And all of that is like, you know, that, that kind of farming is so unsustainable. So now for nutrition wise, it's, you may, you're not doing a whole lot of benefit if you were to eat, like if your diet has nice amount of beans, peas, uh, fruits, vegetables, rice, potatoes, uh, whole grains, like a lot of plant-based ingredients, you're not getting a, any uh, benefit, extra benefit of eating these Atlantic Ocean mussels. On the other hand, you are harming uh, the environment by choosing these, these, these foods. Hope that makes sense. Yeah. Like when it comes to drinking water, so it's not that like uh, you have to like water all of a sudden. Even that is a habit which you can develop. So let's say if you're just able to drink one cup, see like if you can increase to two cups over a one week period time and later uh, you can increase to three cups or four cups. So that's a habit that can be developed and uh, our taste buds do change. And water is important. If you look at your body, you see that 70% of your body is made up of water. So don't you think you want to give that essential thing to your body? Because that's what it's made up of and that's what it is looking for. See, one way to turn it around, Mike, like to, to like something um, that you don't like right now is think of the benefits. Like when you, when you just drink water, like, you know, research shows that just drinking water uh, for anywhere from six to eight cups of water on a daily basis, it boosts your energy, it boosts your mood, like makes you more happier, it makes your metabolism like uh, more efficient, and you lose fat. You know, uh, the first step for you to lose, for you to burn the stored fat, is actually adding water to the fat. It's called uh, lipolysis. 
So the first step by uh, if to break down the stored fat is actually to add add uh, water. So many benefits. So think of the benefits. Like uh, how many of you um, had uh, like for example, uh, you know, some of you might have liked alcohol. Uh, may not have liked the alcohol in the uh, like when you had it for the first time. But as you keep as you kept at it, like you even tolerated that bitter taste of alcohol. Right. If you can tolerate the bitter taste of alcohol to an extent to that you can like it, you know, a simple. You can definitely, <laughs> you can definitely you know, uh, like water after some time. Yes. <laughs> and then keep thinking of the benefits. Keep thinking of the benefits, how good it will do, how good you will feel. And, you know, you know, likes and our likes and dislikes, they change. Don't get stuck on some, oh, I like this, I don't like this, I like this, I don't like this. All your likes and dislikes will become, will, will keep you stuck. So it's okay to have a preference, right? Okay, you know, you don't like water, but you have benefit. You have lots of benefits of drinking water. See how can you can make it more tastier, like uh, lemon, adding some lemon is fine. I mean, other day we had... Uh, a few of our uh, uh, son's uh, friends uh, you know, came for a play evening. They're like a bunch of boys playing poker, having fun. And then you know, we, uh, we made like yeah. a big jug of water, right? Like we had this container of water, like this big. Uh, it was holding like almost two or three gallons. Uh, what, did, what did we slice up in it? Yeah, so we added uh, some uh, clementines, strawberries. So that gives a nice taste to the water and the teenagers. So instead of offering them pop, soda, or any sugary drinks, we just offered them water and threw in some fruit to just sweeten a little bit and uh, they, they enjoyed drinking it. So adding that like sliced strawberries or sliced oranges or cucumber, mint leaves, they, they add nice flavor to the water and they enhance the water. What about dark chocolate? Is it better for us? Uh, well, see the uh, thing about dark chocolate. Acid reflux. Yeah, yeah, like so the thing is dark chocolate. Again, chocolate is made up of cocoa powder, sugar, and uh, uh, like a, some, some form of uh, fat to, to emulsify it and soften it. So sometimes it may be soy lecithin. Sometimes it may be, there may be like a palm oil in it. Sometimes it may be milk fat. So it needs some kind of fat and sugar to, for you to, in, to, to stomach it. So the benefits of dark chocolate actually come from the cocoa powder. It's not, it's not coming from the sugar or it's not coming from the added fat. So if you want to enjoy dark chocolate uh, a bit, uh, I would say make something of your own from the from the cocoa powder or some uh, like a semi sweetened uh, chocolate chips that are easily available at Costco. Um, the thing is, there is some research showing that yes, having dark chocolate is okay, uh, but you have to know yourself. Like, can you be someone? you could just eat like one square of the dark chocolate or like you think are you someone like who after having that one square of dark chocolate you keep saying you know what this tastes so good dark chocolate is so good for me and you just keep eating and eating and you got to finish it right like if you if you are someone who has a tendency to uh, go after chocolate until you finish it then like again as we said like the chocolate does increase the incidence of acid reflux. So uh, be mindful of that. If you just have like one square and you are okay with that, that you may be fine, but uh, there is nothing magical, super magical about uh, dark chocolate. Use cocoa powder in your dishes and make your own chocolate dishes like we have recipes on the Gift of Health site, uh, how to make black bean brownies. Uh, you could, it's delicious recipe. You, we are using uh, uh, black beans oats, applesauce, healthy ingredients, uh, cocoa powder, and then uh, um, we are adding a, a bit of maple syrup and semi-sweetened uh, chocolate chips and some baking powder, vanilla extract. The recipe is there on the gift of a site. Uh, so easy to make. Uh, we, we have made uh, like different kinds of chocolate puddings and chocolate cakes and chocolate, 
uh, like truffles. truffles uh, all these can be made from scratch uh, with just a little bit of uh, effort. Sean is saying, I just finished a plant-based jigs hash with added edamame, chickpeas, and beans. Lots of water with it. You go, Sean. Sounds delicious. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Good, good. Keep them coming. You guys are on a roll. Let's see. Excellent. Good. Okay, so there are some more questions here. Um, is food labeled organic more nutritious than traditional, uh, conventionally grown vegetables and fruits? Have you ever wondered like whether uh, you should go for organic versus the conventional, traditional, traditionally grown vegetables? I, I, it's, it sounds so strange because I'm saying conventional or traditional, is where we have learned, we have come to accept using some pesticides uh, and herbicides, and we are calling it as conventional or traditional. Where once upon a time, it just just two generations ago, that was like growing organic. There was only go organic actually. Two two generations ago, there was no uh, not much usage of pesticides or herbicides. Everything was organic. Yes. When we come, we are living in Newfoundland, and we have spoken to uh, several of uh, uh, like uh, senior citizens here, who are in like seventies and eighties and nineties, and all we heard was how much people grew food from the land, and um, they ate the those those vegetables that are traditionally grown here, and even back home, like where we came from, India. It was all like traditionally grown, um, I mean, organically grown vegetables. It was all uh, growing without um, pesticides, herbicides, and fertilizers like nitrogen based fertilizers was the norm. Um, and uh, we love growing stuff. Like, we have uh, many of you know that uh, we do have like green thumb, and um, uh, there were years where we grew 30 to 40 different vegetables right in our backyard. 30 to, different, 30 to 40 different uh, fruits and vegetables, yeah. So uh, do you have to go for organic vegetables all the time or organic fruit all the time? Uh, not necessarily, like, you know, if, you, if organic is available and you can afford it, go for it. But if it is not available and if you can't afford it, research shows that just eating fruits and vegetables whether they are organic or not, like even if they are not organic, it is still beneficial to eat them uh, rather than avoid them. So there is one research showing that um, uh, it is estimated that if people take like five to seven servings of fruits and vegetables daily, it could prevent almost 10,000 cancers uh, just in US and Canada alone. Whereas, uh, and that study was, based on the fruits and vegetables grown conventionally with pesticides or herbicides or fertilizers and all. And that research also shows that the, the number of cancers that are linked to, um, linked to intake of pesticides or herbicides or fertilizers was about like maybe 10. So you, you're seeing 10,000 cancers prevented versus 10 cancers happening because of this. So the odds are in favor of just eating fruits and vegetables, whether they're conventional or not. Make sense? So Maureen is asking, I have been told by my doctor that I have a very small sliding hiatus hernia. I said not to worry, but it feels like I have a lump in the throat sometimes when I swallow. Any foods I should avoid? So uh, by means of your question, uh, um, Maureen, like, uh, so it seems like you had an uh, endoscopy or some kind of test through which your doctor diagnosed you with a small hiatus hernia. Um, if you feel like you have a lump in throat, uh, you should run it uh, by your doctor to make sure there is nothing going on with the throat. Um, and uh, 
even if you have the endoscopy and if you have the sensation of the lump in the throat, maybe it's not a bad idea to get checked by the ENT doctor as well. So only, see anyone who has this difficulty swallowing lump in throat, before I give them food advice, especially anyone who's in 50s and 60s, it is important that you have a thorough investigation, a checkup, because uh, if there is something going on in, in the throat area, you want to know about it and like fix that uh, rather than just changing the food. So let's say if you had that workup of endoscopy or the ENT checkup and there is nothing that was found, then I would say, uh, and you still have the sensation of a lump in the throat when you swallow, it's important to, to chew your food very well. And it's important to stick with the plant-based foods. Like plant-based foods are easier to digest and swallow. Like you take uh, uh, simple foods like carrots and potatoes and rice and beans. These are easy to chew and swallow compared to chicken and meat and moose and uh, like pork and ham. These are hard to chew and swallow. So it's important to avoid the meats. Just for example, even last week, uh, I had a patient uh, uh, where I had to do an endoscopy and retrieve a piece of uh, uh, meat that was stuck in the in the food pipe. Uh, in in my last twelve years here, in 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 uh, um, working as a surgeon here in Newfoundland, I have taken out uh, this pieces of meat from hundreds of people's like food pipe, but I've never so far taken out uh, like uh, uh, had to go in and take out a piece of broccoli or beans or uh, rice or potatoes. So Mike is asking, which bread is better for you? White bread or raisin bread or roll or, or no, no bread or no bread? Well, uh, the thing is, um, when it comes to um, breads, right? Uh, it's important that you learn how to read a nutrition label. Like when you look at the nutrition label, you have to look and see what ingredients were used in making that bread. So let's say if the bread has uh, the ingredients, there is oil in it, there is sugar in it, and there is uh, butter and milk products in, in that, like the, then it's better to avoid those breads. Like, so it's uh, go for the breads which are made with the whole grain or multigrain and uh, not much oil in it and not much added sugar in that. So if you have to choose between the, the white bread and the whole grain and multigrain bread, go with the, the breads that has the least amount or no added sugar or oil with them. But Mike, what is even better, what is even better than bread is to choose intact grains. Uh, a bread is something that made with the wheat. You take the wheat, you powder it into flour, and then you make the dough and then make the bread, right? Whereas uh, like intact grains means like you're using either uh, uh, oat groats or steel cut oats or quinoa, barley, brown rice, millets. Like when you eat this like wild rice or quinoa, barley, you're using the intact grain. You're keeping the grain intact. So that is much more better for you because the absorption of sugar uh, is much gradual compared to when you go for the, the processed like breads, your absorption of uh, uh, the sugar into your uh, bloodstream is much faster and you, you have sugar spikes. Yes, so uh, under those lines, Rochelle is asking, is Ezekiel bread good? Yeah, Ezekiel bread is a better, much better uh, choice, much better choice than uh, uh, the other breads because Ezekiel bread doesn't have uh, any added oils. It doesn't have any added sugar. And uh, many of them, the salt is not that much and it is made with the sprouted whole, uh, sprouted the grain ingredients. So is it, if you have a choice, Ezekiel bread is, is better bread. Okay. So Rochelle is asking, I have been on a very strict whole food plant-based diet, no oils, and in four months was able to drop cholesterol from 275 to 145 and was able to drop triglycerides by 88 points to 168. One month later, I had another blood test and my triglycerides went up to 191. I looked at my food log and the only thing different 
uh, was I had corn on the cob daily and four tablespoons of air popped corn daily. Would this make my triglycerides go up? What can help triglycerides go down? So the triglycerides are the breakdown products of the fats. If there is uh, excess sugar intake, excess uh, a simple refined carbohydrate intake, then that uh, simple sugars are the excess carbohydrates, processed carbohydrates, they can get turned into triglycerides as well. So um, it's good that you have identified that like this four tablespoons of air popped corn and uh, corn and the carb. This, yes, just uh, because the like, um, if you have observed that without the adding this corn and the carb and air popped corn, your triglycerides were low, it may not be a bad idea just to try to put this aside and, and recheck and see, then you will know, it, is it just that, that um, change, uh, that just one change, is it bringing your triglycerides up? That's the best way to know. Yeah. But air pop yeah. corn, like if you, when you pop the, the corn, it, it is also faster to absorb. Like if you eat the corn and the carb, it is a bit slower to absorb, but air popped corn, it is faster to absorb. So that yeah. can potentially uh, raise. And in the food log, it's better to observe like what are the flour-based things we had. So let's say even if it is made with uh, whole grain or whole wheat, if uh, we are eating more flour-based products, that also increases our triglycerides. So that's one thing to, uh, one thing to note. And the other thing is alcohol uh, that raises uh, triglycerides as well. So um, sometimes even when you're going through a process of fat loss, like mm -hmm. losing weight, your triglycerides can go up temporarily. So what is important is not just one reading, Rochelle, like get, your, get it checked again in a month or two and, and see what's the trend. Connie's saying hi. Hello, Connie. Mm -hmm. Uh, Geraldine, you can make cornbread. Uh, yes, like, see, the thing is, is the when it comes to bread, yeah, when it comes to breads, any bread, like either cornbread or whole wheat bread, Ezekiel bread, bread was a food that was designed by humans for our convenience. <laughs> Do you see it growing on the trees? Is it natural? No. So bread doesn't happen in the nature. What happens in the nature are the grains. So the grains are uh, wheat or like brown rice or uh, oats, or barley, quinoa, millets, teff, amaranth. There are many types of grains. So nature gave us so many grains for us to enjoy. If you keep the grains intact and eat more grains in the intact form, you would have less problems. But this question about bread keeps coming up because we've been like, it, it's a food that, that is created out of convenience. And if it is, if the bread is made from the whole, some ingredients, then it may not be a, that much problem. But most of the store-bought bread or even homemade bread, you, if you're using too much flour-based foods, especially if you have diabetes or pre-diabetes or high cholesterol, or you have a weight to lose, eating too much bread, it can slow down your progress to progress of uh, recovering from those diseases. So minimize the bread intake and maximize the, the intake of uh, intact grains. And what is even more um, helpful for you, uh, for everyone to focus on is to eat more uh, legumes, which are beans and uh, lentils and um, uh, like uh, all kinds of different kinds of beans and lentils, they they keep your blood sugar steady and uh, uh, you, your health, uh, you see so many health benefits from that. So Geraldine is asking, what was the name of the flower, please? We didn't say any name of the flower, Geraldine, like uh, uh, there was a question about Ezekiel bread. That's, um, that's the uh, bread that we were talking about, Ezekiel bread. So do you and Shobha ha ever have food cravings? Yes, absolutely, yeah. Uh, we crave, uh, I mean, different kinds of things. And uh, 
but we have learned to deal with it in different ways. So we can do a whole class on it. <laughs> yeah. so. And what you would notice is your cravings would change. So earlier when, before moving to plant-based diet, obviously like when we were eating uh, meats, eggs, uh, dairy, mm -hmm. at that time, our cravings was different. Like we, we used to crave for meat-based dishes or dairy-based dishes. And once we shifted to plant-based, then our cravings were a little bit different. Uh, once we plantified, so whatever our favorite dishes, we, we plantified those. So our new cravings became our plantified version of our favorite food. So even when it came to dairy, uh, we were making that with uh, uh, soy yogurt or uh, with the soft silken tofu, uh, when, whenever we were making this yogurt dips and all that. So even though like our cravings was for them, we, we were just substituting the healthy ingredients. And later, as we started eating more vegetables, more greens, what we noticed was our cravings actually changed. We were cravings for salad. Would you believe that? Like we were craving for uh, crispy uh, vegetables or uh, uh, fruits. And not, like now I would say like uh, cravings are different. Uh, there are certain fr uh, fruits, uh, that I might uh, sometime crave. So you would notice as your taste buds change, your cravings would change as well. Other day, like uh, last week, we were watching this uh, movie on Netflix. It's called RRR. It's a <laughs> fantastic movie on Netflix. So we watched it uh, last week and uh, we said, okay, can we, let's make some popcorn. So we made, uh, we just took some uh, uh, air popped, uh, like the, um, corn the, yeah, corn kernels and just popped in the microwave and we enjoyed that. And uh, uh, last week, I think uh, we did a cooking demo uh, for a, a, a group of uh, um, like entrepreneurs uh, to show them how to have a healthy junk food. So um, like if you crave uh, chips or chocolate or ice cream, our cheese, our fried things, our fries, whatever you crave, you can plantify them, right? So um, like when we, let's say if you're- Craving for ice cream. Yeah, so all you have to do is take a ripe, uh, like we always have uh, frozen uh, fruit. Uh, fruit in our um, freezer. freezer. Uh, so like we have some frozen bananas and uh, we just run them through our, uh, for a desert machine, like uh, we have like a Uranus machine and also desert bullet. Like our, if you don't have that, it's okay. You just, you just take the frozen fruit and blend it in your blender. Uh, just like that, or add a drop of soy milk or almond milk, and then you could enjoy it like a ice cream. Uh, if you have like chocolate cravings, you just get some semi-sweet, uh, uh, semi-sweet and chocolate chips, which we always have handy. And then just take a few and then, Put them, melt them uh, in the microwave uh, with a, just a spoon of water. Uh, you get this chocolate uh, syrupy kind of thing and dip a, like a take a, either you can dip strawberries or um, you can uh, like a, you know, cut some apple or you can have like in a chocolate covered apple or uh, you want to go even more sweeter, take a date, like a medjool date, take the pit out, put like a, uh, either almond or uh, cashew in it, and then uh, uh, roll that uh, medjool date in the chocolate. And if you want, you can have it just like, uh, freeze it in the freezer for about five minutes. Uh, you can have it just like that, or you can roll it in coconut as well. So or, we have- Or, or you can uh, take bananas, cut it into pieces and uh, roll in the chocolate, put a stick and put it in the freezer. So they will be your lollipops. So banana uh, chocolate lollipop. So mm -hmm. it's not that we don't get cravings. We get, yeah, our frequency of cravings has gone down way, 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 way less. Like there was a time when we were going through medical school um, in the middle of the night, we were, you know, we would 
crave for having some chicken biryani and some fries and then um we would uh, you know go to this uh, restaurants that where we used to live in india they were uh, open even at like midnight like we would have like a midnight biryani with uh, fries and chips and uh, you know chocolate or ice cream but now as shiva was saying like we we crave having a good health good a filling salad with like nice dressing on or a, 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 a like a hearty filling a bowl of like beans or chickpeas with some you know different fruits and veggies so our cravings have changed so much and even if we crave uh, we get craves uh, cravings about chips or popcorn or chocolate or fries or ice cream we have no problem like there you you can find the link for uh, the healthy junk food guide it and uh, recipes. recipes there you are welcome to use it again th- this is this is not your principal food right we you could enjoy these things as long as you are eating lots of fruits and vegetables whole grains and beans and enjoy some of these but um, these are these are much better alternatives compared to the store bought stuff okay so mike is asking do moose meat have any fat in it like local cow meat that is raised on a farm well uh, uh, the thing is um, it's not just about the amount of fat in the meat uh, research shows that the animal protein itself uh, can increase the uh, inflammation can uh, increase the risk of uh, uh, getting cancers by increasing the the growth or proliferation of the cells by raising the igf1 level and also the animal based foods whether it is moose or fish or pig these are loaded with bacteria right what happens when you take a piece of moose meat uh, and just leave it on the kitchen counter for for uh, for about 12 hours 15 hours one day it rots right because that that meat whether it is whatever the animal it is coming from it is loaded with bacteria and it is actively rotting anything that is actively rotting you put it into your body it increases inflammation because all that bacterial load it increases the release of endotoxins uh in in your blood and that increases inflammation yeah so increased inflammation increased risk of diabetes heart disease cancers uh whether it is moose meat or any kind of meat it's not just about the fat there are many things in the meat that increase the risk of your disease yeah the other thing is we might uh, come under the impression that since uh, uh, if it's uh, locally raised on the farm maybe they may not have any fat so maybe moose meat doesn't have much fat that may be the impression but like when you cook moose meat do you, do you see the drippings coming out of them so or when when you put them in oven like do do you see the drippings uh, so that is nothing but fat so even though you may not see fat in terms of external fat uh the meat does have fat so the the way the animal stores fat is it stores in between muscle fibers you may not see a whole lot of fat outside but even if you take chicken breast or like a moose meat or whatever thinking that it's lean meat you throw it in the oven you see like a lot of uh, fat down there so it's not just about the fat like it's it's the protein itself the animal protein research shows that it increases uh, like there are host or multitude of problems with it good lots of good questions you guys keep it interesting every week <laughs> <laughs> we love showing up and answering your questions so keep them coming uh um, share this with your friends and family members invite them to uh the gift of health uh, community we do have a gift of health the total wellness group join the group you can uh, follow us on uh, instagram and also on youtube uh yeah we'd love to be a, a part of your uh, healing recovering journey and um yeah if we don't have any more questions we can sign off <laughs> Uh-huh. I'm seeing it. So did we miss anything? I think we covered pretty yeah. much everything, yeah. Yeah. 
Oh, you're welcome, Rochelle. Good, good. So yeah, just keep keep the likes and loves and shares. Keep it going. That's how we spread the word. <laughs> good luck, everyone. We'll see you next week. Yeah, and enjoy the evenings now. Like you have uh, long evenings. Enjoy, have a nice walk. Enjoy the nature while the sun is uh, still shining. So. Have a wonderful rest of your evening and we'll see you next week.